going to turn on my mic. Sorry about that. Um, I also wanted to take a moment and officially welcome Mr. Kerr and Mr. Tanner to the table, as well as Councillor Harland, who's joining us for the for the first time as well. So the makeup of the committee has grown and changed, and I look forward to everything uh, in front of us. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so I'd be looking for a motion to approve the agenda. Okay, moved, seconded by Kevin. Thank you very much. If nobody has any changes or questions. Um, I will call the question. All those in favor of approving the agenda as presented, signify by saying aye. And none opposed. So we will move forward on this agenda. Thank you very much. Uh, and are there any declarations of conflict of interest at this point? If there are any, just indicate. Seeing none, we will move forward. Uh, we have the confirmation or the minutes rather from February 15th meeting. Um, I hope everyone's had an opportunity to review. If so, um, I'd be looking for a motion to adopt these minutes. Make a motion to adopt the minutes. Thank you very much. Do I have a seconder for that? Thank you very much, Councillor Harland. No changes or edits or questions. All those in favor of adopting the minutes from February 15th, please signify by saying aye. And any opposed? None. Those minutes are adopted. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on, our agenda items tonight, we have um, a presentation uh, by Mr. Gopin. Uh, we take the uh, opportunity when we can to refresh on our, uh, as much as we refreshed on our admin and paperwork last month, we like to take an opportunity to also refresh and orient our new members to, uh, yes, to the activities of the Planning Advisory Committee. So we'll turn it over, yeah. So it is the 30 slide presentation with uh, rules, procedures, regulations. Um, it's a lot of information. It's this is definitely a uh, commitment where you will learn as you go, I think. Um, and you're very lucky to have a chair who's uh, very experienced, has um, in, in some ways we're very lucky because Jill, before she was on PAC, she was on Pratt, which was regional body. And I'll talk about that difference in a second. But as Bayside and Shamcook are now included, you might have actually done some files, been involved in some when you were part of Pratt. So um, it's kind of nice to have the whole family together again. Uh, so we can jump to the next slide. And it's this is this is PAC. It's not PRAC. PRAC is a um, it's a committee of the Regional Service Commission, and uh, St. Andrews used to be a part of PRAC uh, until I think 2021 or maybe it's 2020, um, and then the decision was made to form a PAC to have a little bit more local control over decisions that were made, and um the community planning act i'll talk about hierarchy of bylaws in a second but the community planning act for me is uh the very top it's what the province says uh you can and can't do when it comes to planning legislation uh, planning decisions um planning committees all of these different things so it authorizes um planning advisory committees as well as prax uh you do have to create a planning advisory committee bylaw, which was done at that time. And it's it's a very simple bylaw that basically says this committee exists and it will do these things. Um, what's a little bit more important is your own rules and operating procedures, which PACs uh, develop themselves. Um, it's so and I believe there'll be some discussion on that tonight. Uh, and you're all appointed by council. And you represent the municipality, which is now, uh, we call it kind of the old town site. I'm not sure how it will develop, but got the the Platte and uh, original St. Andrews. And then you've got Bayside and Shamcook as well. And there's some complications to that, which hopefully over the next uh, year or two, we'll be able to consolidate some of the planning documents. Uh, we can jump to the next slide. Um, 
So you don't really need to worry about the uh, right side of the slide. That's really just for prax. This is a presentation that's been uh, adopted from the province uh, over time. So um, they do touch on both, but after this slide, it's really just uh, PAC stuff. Um, so as I said before, uh, the PAC kind of uh, the Community Planning Act uh, establishes what the committee can and can't do. Um, it's very standard. Uh, there's you know every municipality that has a PAC is dealing with the same kind of things um, and operates in a fairly similar way. Kevin. Uh, your operating procedures, as I said, are more kind of relevant to your day-to-day -day operation. It involves election of officers, uh, how you deal with applications as they come in, um, how you give public notice, how the meetings run, what's on the agenda, uh, what the requirements are for attendance, roles and responsibilities. So those are definitely um, worthwhile reviewing and knowing exactly uh, how you are supposed to operate and proceed. And again, uh, you have a very experienced chair who I'm sure will keep everybody in line. We can jump to the next slide. So I mentioned before, the legal authority for the PAC comes from the Community Planning Act. And uh, you'll notice that when you start actually making decisions, we will always tie back to the Community Planning Act and just it, it's kind of a cover your basis kind of thing. We'll say the Community Planning Act says you, PAC, can make this kind of decision. Um, it's in your jurisdiction, so to speak. There's two sort of functions that a PAC plays. There's an advisory function and there's an approval function. Um, so the red box there is talking about your advisory function. And in that role, you offer views to counsel uh, and you do have a counselor on the committee, uh, Councillor Harland. Um, so there is some flow through there, but uh, really um, PAC operates as its own body and will give independent views to council. Uh, council is not obligated to make decisions based on those views, but they certainly take the opinions of PAC seriously. Um, and oftentimes the views do lead to changes in bylaws. And it's, worth noting that bylaws under the community planning act a rezoning is a bylaw so that's that's a very common um that's probably the most common view but if we do a new municipal plan you'll be asked to give views on that um rural plan amendments which are now uh something that will be in your purview uh you would be asked about that as well um also, when there are subdivisions with new infrastructure uh, that are basically requiring the municipality to take on roads, sewer, uh, any of that public infrastructure, or uh, this thing called land for public purposes, which, um, again, I'm throwing a ton of information at you. Don't <laughs> feel like you have to remember it all as the there's no test. Next month. Um, not tonight. I try and do uh, when when we start doing, you know, actual applications and stuff, I'll I'll go through. Here's what this is. I'll try and remind you of these things. Um, and we can probably send the uh, slideshow out after for some review. Um, but you're also so when there's new infrastructure, new new roads, uh, that kind of thing. Um, land for public purposes. Again, that's land that's being given to a municipality for a public purpose. Uh, PAC is asked to give views to council so that council has kind of a uh, additional um, lens on uh, if there are aspects of a subdivision agreement that should be considered. For example, um, if you're aware there's a subdivision uh, for some apartment buildings at the corner of Bar and Mowat, um, and PAC recommended uh, buffering along the sides of uh, the property so that it's not as visible from the street. And that's something that was carried through into the subdivision uh, development agreement. So that's just an example of how that can work. Council said, yeah, we, we think that makes a lot of sense and we are going to require the developer to do that. The approvals are um, where you as a body have decision-making authority. And there 
generally for uh, less, I don't want to say less serious or less important, um, but they tend to be more uh, specific decisions, like specific property dimensions, um, variances, uh, you know, is somebody going more into their side yard, putting something closer to the property line um, than the bylaw says they can. That's an example of a, a variance, a dimensional variance. There's also temporary uses. Um, so bylaws say what you can and can't do. There is uh, something you can apply to PAC for where you can say, I want to try this thing out or it's only going to be there for up to 12 months. And um, it's you don't have to go through an amendment of the zoning bylaw, which takes a lot longer. Um, it's it's a little bit of like, let's try this thing out. So uh, some examples of that in the community. And uh, both of these have turned into permanent establishments. Char and Chowder, that started as a temporary use. And uh, I think because they had um, they had to get a food truck license or something like that. Um, and then the Montague Rose, a really good example of um, a temporary use leading to a full-time business after rezoning. And when we did the temporary use initially, there was some concern from the neighbors about parking and uh, noise and things like that. And PA, I think it was PC, it might've been PRAC at the time actually, PRAC. it was PRAC. PRAC approved it and uh, when we came, when it came time to the rezoning a year later, there were no concerns because they'd been operating for a year. People knew what was going on. So that's, that's a typical path for temporary use as it leads to a rezoning. Um, similar compatible uses, uh, that's, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about these in detail uh, in a second. Um, I think there are some slides on that. So I'll, I'll get to those when we get there. Um, and I'll just try and move through quickly. So as I said, there's this hierarchy. Uh, we can jump to the next slide, Paul. Hierarchy of legislation. Um, the Community Planning Act is at the top of the pyramid. It's a provincial document. Um, it has it gets amended from time to time. Uh, local government's reform led to a lot of amendments in it. Um, it's something I look at a lot to to figure out how to make decisions, give advice, what procedures need to happen. Um, and as I said, off, we'll always tie things back to it and say, you know, you're authorized to do this. Um, but it's not something that this committee has any control over. Uh, council doesn't have any control over it. It's the province's document. Um, you can advocate for things, but that's that's really it. And it, it doesn't get into details at all. That's really up to a municipality through their municipal plan, zoning bylaw, or rural plan, um, and I'll, I'll talk about these in the context of St. Andrews in a minute, so I won't really get into the details, um, but they are only dealing with the municipality. You can even have something called a secondary municipal plan, which deals with a specific area of a municipality, and St. Andrews has one of those, and I'll talk about that in a second. You also have a subdivision bylaw, which lays out how subdivisions uh, happen. There's there's things about how streets should be laid out, um, requirements for uh, uh, what should be considered when land is given for public purposes, what can and can't be in subdivision agreements. Um, it comes very, it's very closely linked to the Community Planning Act. Um, and isn't something I work with a whole lot. Uh, we have a senior development officer in the office, in the office, Judy Hartford. Um, she's really an expert in subdivision. She's been doing it for 20 years now, I think. Um, so if we have any subdivision files, she'll probably be the one that you're talking to. Uh, and then there are some other things. There's building bylaws. Um, there could be I, you know what? I'm not going to confuse. You. I'm not going to talk about a heritage conservation bylaw because it's <laughs> not something this committee will be dealing with. So we'll leave that out. The next slide. So these are uh, the specific documents for the town of St. Andrews. There's the municipal plan. Um, and great, everybody. People have uh, bigger packages with things in them. Great. Um, you're also very lucky to have uh, 
great municipal staff, Paul Knopper and Chris Spear, uh, really excellent. I don't, there's so many things I don't have to worry about because I know that they've taken care of it. Um, I was actually hired to uh, work on this plan. Um, it was, it scope had grown too big for Alex to do it alone. So uh, I moved out here and uh, five years ago and started working on this plan. And uh, it took two years to pass. So that gets us to 2023. Um, <laughs> and it's, won't get into property by property things. Uh, it's more big objectives, policies. Um, uh, there's one of their proposals. Um, they all mean slightly different things. And it does talk about what those things are and how they're relevant, who they apply to. Um, there's, if you've ever worked with any legal documents, you know that the words may and shall are super, super important. Um, so there's, there's that kind of language in that plan. Council may do this, uh, council shall do this. It's, and this comes from the community planning act doesn't obligate council to do things. They just can't act contrary to it. Um, so there may be a proposal that council should investigate, uh, a bylaw to protect trees. Um, council doesn't have to do that, but they probably can't um, come out with a bylaw that says we're going to cut all the trees down. I, that would never happen. That's an absurd example. Uh, but it touches on various areas um, that implicate land use, uh, but might not be directly talking about land use. Um, though it's a very comprehensive document doesn't get amended very often. Uh, there is this generalized future land use map, which ties into the zoning map. So sometimes we have to do map amendments um, because of a rezoning. But generally, it's a it's a stable document. It's what guides council. Um, and it's very important when we're looking at variances in uh, the town of the old town of St. Andrews, this document, um, the policies and proposals oftentimes give hints and clues as to what, you know, what is the overall objective of the zoning bylaw versus the specific uh, thing that it's pointing at in that case. Um, so uh, I'll give an example here. Um, you might have something in municipal plan that talks about uh neat and orderly patterns of development. And that kind of ties into setbacks and uh, all of these kind of dimensional things that um, when you drive, especially through the plat and you have that level of density, you do notice a certain amount of uniformity and regularity. Um, we had a file that happened to be in, I think in the service residential zone, which is the main residential zone. And it was nowhere near any other houses. And uh, they, they wanted to do something that um, went into a side yard. So the municipal plan gives you the uh, indication that the intent of those are really about what is the overall area like. So when you have something that's isolated, those tend to not apply as much. And so that in that case was a reasonable variance. Um, I would recommend, uh, you know, it's I think it's a 30 or 40 page document. Um, it should be fairly easy to read and understand, and it should give an overall sense of, at least at the time, uh, and, and as I said, there haven't been many changes, even though it was a previous council. Um, it's it's guided the town here so far, so uh, it's one I would definitely try and read through. The next one. Just give me one second. So, PAC, just so you're aware that the zoning bylaw, secondary municipal plan, and municipal plan are all 10 year documents. They are living documents, can be modified and changed, but they are basically on 10 year per time periods before they get fully reviewed and, and redone. But yeah. And with... the, the idea is that you shouldn't have, you, you try and move away from the political kind of four or five year cycle and have things that are a little bit longer lasting. The entire community has involvement in creating. As I said, that was a two-year process to do that municipal plan. Uh, lots of meetings, um, and and in the end, um, you know, none of these documents make everybody happy. But I think 
the the town as a whole was very happy with that process and uh, what's happened since um, in terms of uh, development and growth. So secondary municipal plan um, is it's a little bit different. It really focuses on design in the town plat and historic business district. And it mostly deals with uh, new builds and um, extensive renovations. It's not a heritage conservation bylaw. Um, it's not something I think this committee would necessarily be involved in. There might be some crossover of committee members if that happens. Um, but this doc, but the secondary municipal plan is not about preservation. It's it's about how does new development in these what were considered. Uh, more sensitive areas, um, especially, uh, you know, the historic business. Just, I think actually the whole plat is um, recognized by Parks Canada as a national historic site. Um, so obviously it's taken seriously by the country. Um, it's taken seriously by the town. So uh, the idea was it should get some extra attention, um, but it's actually not a document that can be varied. So if PAC gets involved in decisions around this, it will be giving advice to council. Um, and there have been a few things that have come up recently which have involved this. Uh, some of them have been uh, very simple and there was one amendment recently. Again, it was kind of this property that was down uh, what was essentially a dead end road um, on a kind of strange block. This document really is about context and what are you doing in relation to the other buildings? and uh, didn't really apply there. And then it was uh, very heavily implicated in the recent discussions around the corner of Princess Royal and Water Street. Uh, and in the end, council did not give the amendments required for that to go through. Um, so that proposal isn't moving forward. Um, so that's the secondary municipal plan. And it's, again, it's a good document to look through. One way that PAC can use it, it's not just regulations there's also best practices in it and we tried to make it a more visual uh it is talking about aesthetic so kind of highlight those um so it's it's again it's a document i'd recommend looking through uh it's not something that i would say you should necessarily take things from that document and apply them to things outside of the plat um wasn't really intended for that but there may be uh, conditions that you want to add that are based on the best practices. Next slide, Paul. Okay, so the zoning bylaw. This is the one that uh, you'll probably be dealing with the most and you can try and read through it, but it's gonna be really hard. <laughs> and uh, as someone who's worked with it for uh, and, and was involved in drafting it, um for five or six years i cannot tell you everything in it i will probably know where to find it so that's the best i can do um it's really as you get applications you'll need to become familiar with certain sections of it um it deals with dimensions so we call those standards in the zoning bylaw so where things can be in a lot how high they can be um what's the floor area uh things like that, um, but then it also deals with uses. So what's what type of use can you have on the land? And that um, that is dealt with in different bylaws differently. St. Andrews currently is very prescriptive. So in the, um, we'll take the serviced residential zone, for example. Uh, so that's kind of most of the town plat where you have houses. Uh, you can do single family dwelling, two family dwelling, three family dwelling, and that's basically it. Central commercial zone, that's kind of most the, the downtown part of Water Street. Um, that's a mixed use zone. So you can have multiple uses in a building. Um, so, and that's very much the pattern of, pattern of development there. Uh, and one of the things that people love about it, I think, is that it's this, uh, you know, very walkable, uh, lots of windows so you can see into shops there's lots of life on the streets um in the summer you've got patios uh, there's lots of engagement and interaction 
Um, but then upstairs, uh, most of those buildings, you have two or three floors of, uh, sorry, one or two floors of apartments. Um, so you have people living there um, and that adds to the life as well. So uh, that's, that's a neat zone. And um, the Canadian Institute of Planners, which I'm a member of, awarded Water Street uh, a, a great street award in 2017. Mm. Yeah, I think it was when uh, HAP was around. Um, <laughs> but you can, it's on the plaque down there. You can go take a look. Uh, there are uses, uh, in talking about uses, um, there are some that are just allowed, like I was saying in the service residential zone. There are some that are conditional. So they're, basically allowed, but they might have other things that need to be considered. Um, so in that service residential zone, and I think the last file the PAC dealt with was what's called a converted dwelling. That's when you have uh, a single family or two family dwelling that is adding a unit that is bigger than an accessory dwelling unit. So that you can probably just do, but if you go over 902 square feet, then we're looking at a converted dwelling and that's a use that requires terms and conditions from PAC. And it even says in the zoning bylaw when PAC is uh, considering converted dwellings, you should think about uh, how the entrances are laid out and parking, or is that just something that I made sure was there um, <laughs> or recommended to be there. Uh, so you can't, approve those or turn them down, you set conditions. And there may be a case where the conditions that are required can't be met. And so that's how those are turned down. But I um, haven't really seen that happen. Um, okay, so the next slide, we're gonna get into the rural plans. These are, um, I almost wanna call them legacy documents. Uh, this the Bayside one was passed in 2009. Um, Sham Cook was 2011, I think, but both of those are well, almost 15 years old. Um, and they'll probably be updated soon with a big process where we do everything at once. Um, but they're what we have now. So uh, until those get updated, they're what we're working with. Um, rural plans are generally a lot simpler than uh, zoning bylaws. They are kind of a combination of a municipal plan and a zoning bylaw. They have uh, policies, objectives, and proposals, uh, just like a municipal plan. And then they have uh, zoning standards, like a zoning bylaw. Um, but they tend to be you know, much simpler. You've got two or three pages of uh, policy kind of things. Um, and then you might have three to five zones, whereas uh, the municipal, well, the old town site um, has, I want to say over 10 zones, um, which can be simplified. I'm not saying that's that's an ideal situation, um, but uh, rural plans, much simpler. Um, they don't really get as much into standards. There's basically one set of standards for everything with dimensions. Uh, they are dealing almost always with unserviced land. So it's very hard to do things on less than an acre in those rural areas. There, there are some exceptions, um, but uh, that's uh, the Bayside rural plan. Uh, the zones are, there's an industrial zone for the industrial park. Um, there's a watershed zone, which interacts with a provincial regulation we need to deal with that we'll deal with it but for now we'll we'll uh leave it um because there aren't too many files that get involved with that and then there's a rural zone which is a lot of other things um it's it's a mixed use zone but uh it's there's there's been issues with it um there's been some controversial files that have happened. Uh, I think some amendments to it um, over the years that were attempted and and uh, didn't go through when the province was the decision maker. Um, and 
you know, as uh, Paul said, these are 10 year documents and we're looking at 15 years now, basically for this one. So the patterns of development have probably changed. Uh, the, the needs have changed. So, you know, we'll, we'll probably be looking at some updates to this soon. Next one, the Shamcook Rural Plan. Uh, I would love to tell you that this is essentially a mirror of the Bayside Plan with the same zones and everything in it. It's not. Uh, it also has a rural zone, but it's slightly different um, than the Bayside <laughs> Rural Zone. Uh, it has a, a watershed zone, which is a little bit different. Um, and then it has Minister's Island, which is uh, kind of its own special thing because of what Minister's Island is. Um, but other than that, it's uh, you'll look at it and you'll be like, this looks exactly like the uh, Bayside one. Um, very similar. Next one. Uh, the St. Croix Corridor Rural South Plan. Um, this is a very interesting plan uh it runs it actually runs beyond the boundaries of this service commission all the way up to uh into the western valley region north of spednik lake uh to the um source of the saint croix river and then it runs all the way down to the old border of the town of saint andrews uh basically where the estuary begins and it uh doesn't apply in municipality well the old municipality so the town of the old town of st stephen and, and again st andrews are not included um, it only applies within 30 meters of the ordinary high water mark and it is essentially a conservation plan um, it doesn't allow many uses at all uh, in fact if you don't have an existing structure on the land you probably can't build a new one um, but if you have an existing structure, there are some development rights that come from that. Uh, it it does deal with tree preservation. It allows passive recreation um, and some development, as I said. It was, when it was created, uh, based on a management plan that the St. Croix Waterway Commission, which is a international body. It has people from the states and Maine, has people from New Brunswick. Um, they created this, this very interesting management plan. And then the St. Croix Corridor Plan passed in 1995 was the first attempt uh, to kind of implement that management plan. And then it was updated in 2021. So it's kind of cool because it's a linear plan. You don't see those. And also it's it's kind of a cross border thing. Um, I don't know how much it will come up for, for you. What we've seen with it, uh, what Prax saw a lot, not a lot of, but um, people doing uh, shore protection works. Um, so uh, mostly in the kind of the Oak Bay area, there's erosion, some erosion issues. Um, so people are uh, putting in armor stone and things like that to try and keep the erosion from getting worse. And that is a conditional use in that plan. Um, whether it needs to be or not, we find we kind of use the same conditions over and over again. And when that happens, sometimes it just makes sense to say, <laughs> this is a use subject to these things in this section. Um, it doesn't have to come to PAC. We just make sure that people follow those things. Um, but that's the St. Croix Quarter South Rural Plan. And I think that brings us to the end of the plans. Mm -hmm. um, there's a little tool here, which you might find useful. Uh, I don't know if you want to click on that, Paul. We've got internet. Um, we have tried over the last two years to digitize everything and, and create these kind of interactive zoning maps. Um, and so this one in particular, because we don't have one zoning map for all of the municipality now, um, but this one has zoning for the whole region or where there is zoning. And if you zoom in, uh, so if you zoom in on St. Andrews, it's a lot of information. Um, but those yellow areas uh, will actually turn into individual properties with uh, their individual zones. You can click on the properties and it will should pop up uh, a link that will take you to that rural plan. Wow. Yeah. And we do have ones on our uh, main website. There are ones for each of the municipalities and each other. Um, and they are something that you can direct the public to and say, you know, if, you're, if you have questions about your property, uh, 
rather than me try and guess, why don't you go on this website and it will give you information. That's why we have those disclaimers and liability things because they're not always 100% up to date. So this link is embedded on this document. Is there a possibility we could get we it? We could probably email it. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Nerds like me, I'll be all over okay. that map. Oh, uh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Okay. So these are, um, I would recommend reviewing all of these slides, the ones that come next pretty closely, because these are um, the details of how you make decisions, what you're making decisions on. I've touched on uh, most of these already. Um, this is your advisory role, what this talks about. And these also have the sections of the Community Planning Act where that authority comes from. Um, let's move to the next one. I'm not gonna read all the regulations. Uh, this is the sections that deal with subdivision. Um, so you can see it's talking about public or future streets, land for public purposes, um, the things that should be considered. Uh, one thing that comes up a lot with subdivisions is people think about their own individual property and how they're subdividing it and might not think about how does that fit into the surrounding areas. And there are some cases where there are these kind of, uh, there are areas where you could have connections that because of the way land has been subdivided, you can't anymore. Um, and so one of PAC's roles is to try and avoid that. So, and, and to be honest, hopefully you don't get those because we're trying to push people in the right direction when they come with their subdivision applications. Because we say, if you have streets, you know, if you're, if you don't have connecting streets or the possibility for it, um, we're going to recommend against the, the street layout. And so hopefully you don't have to deal with those, but um, <laughs> that can come up because um, as subdivisions happen, they kind of unlock new land and uh, council will be hearing a little bit about that uh, Monday night. Um, so you could tune in if you're interested. <laughs> Go to the next one. Um, so this, these are the things that can be varied. Um, there's... A number of them. Uh, there are some things that are called uh, development officer variances. And those are things that are so minor that a development officer, somebody like myself, um, would say. And usually we do it when it's going to affect one neighbor and that neighbor has signed off on it. Um, we will say, you know, and, and the Community Planning Act gives us the authority to do this. Um, this is not something that needs to go to PAC. It's it's just not worth the time and the effort um, for everybody uh, knowing that it's going to affect one person and that person is fine with it. Um, but but these are all the things uh, that can be varied. Um, typically, you deal with dimensional variances, height. That's a that's a pretty common one, although we haven't seen it in a while. Um, use uh, variances so that's similar to or compatible with uses is this thing like something else um we can jump to the next one uh subdivision yeah so the subdivision bylaw also has standards in it so things about you know how uh wide streets need to be um and so again, those those are things that can be varied. Uh, is the cul-de-sac, you know, a little bit too long? Um, things like that do come up. Uh, but again, you'll probably be hearing about those from Judy, not from me. Next one, please. Uh, what's this? Oh yeah, so these are conditional uses. Um, so I already went over that. And you can see in each zone, if you look at the zoning bio, it'll say one or one of the following main uses is allowed. Uh, the following uses are subject to terms and conditions. Um, and converted dwelling, that's one we've gotten recently. Can't think of any other ones. Yeah. Um, but they they can come up. There's There are some of them. Uh, I think like a gas bar in 
The central commercial zone is a use subject to terms and conditions. <laughs> the new gas station ever opens. <laughs> Next. <laughs> that for a reason no I, I really <laughs> don't do <laughs> not give another <laughs> yeah i will probably if something's happening i'll probably be like you know that thing that you heard about that controversial thing uh like the subway people heard about the subway coming to the yeah so that building can't have a restaurant in it so oh wow subway. yeah because of the way it's built really butcher shop yeah oh because i heard it was open may 1st okay so it's not yeah i <laughs> no that's good yeah that's cool yeah that's nice. Yeah. So it can't, the old butcher shop downtown, right beside yeah. Treadwell. Yeah, because it's downtown a timber frame there. building. Yeah. Uh, there's it's certain. A, it's a mercantile building, not a gathering building. Uh, DAC, may I a... remind you, use your mics? I didn't want them to be on. <laughs> no, that's fair. <laughs> okay. um, it's, it's a building code issue. And I'm not a building inspector. So I just, that's what our building oh. inspector told me. So I'm passing that on. Some yeah. Um, I guess they could get around if they like cooked everything off site and then brought it there and served it. They might be able to get around. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. It seems. I think that's yeah. Or you'd have to do serious upgrades to the fire separations and things like that. Something like that. Yeah. Um. Temporary uses. Yeah. So we talked about temporary uses. Uh, they've come up a little bit. Um, zoning bylaws are things that um, they, when you, when places are growing, it's very common to see amendments and things like this temporary uses, uh, new businesses opening that are trying new things that haven't been done before. So char and chowder is a good example of that with the way they, um, built out and their their kitchen there uh so you might get some of these it's really hard to predict what they will be because they're usually new and uh unusual uh next please so similar to or compatible with uh these are use variances not dimensional variances so the bylaws that you're working with now are very prescriptive. They list the uses that are allowed. And if that use is not listed there, it's not allowed. Similar to or compatible use is the way that you can say, but this thing is close enough to that other thing uh, that isn't specifically listed that um, it should be allowed in that zone without an amendment. Um, and I guess it's worth addressing, uh, the sham cook, the lobster holding thing that was a similar to or compatible with use. It's in the hands of the appeal board. Now we have no idea what's going on with it. Um, but basically the, the decision that PRAC made was that use is similar to or compatible with a light industrial use, which would be allowed in that zone. Um, and obviously that's disputed. Uh, it shouldn't be anything that PAC is making a decision on because, um, well, well, we'll just have to see what the appeal board says. It could come back here. I would be shocked if it went back to PRAC. That would be very strange. Um, but the appeal board has a lot of leeway to make decisions. And it's, uh, I think there is a slide on it, but it is worth knowing that any decision you make can be appealed. PAC has been appealed before. Uh, the decision was overturned. It was the easiest appeal I've ever been a part of. Uh, it was about 15 minutes. The town said, we think this can be overturned. And the applicant wanted it overturned. And everybody was uh, copacetic. And it was overturned. Um, but that's that's what happens if uh, you know you make a decision and, and somebody says, I feel really strongly that this was the wrong decision because, and again, this goes back to the Community Planning Act and what it says you can and can't appeal on, it's unreasonable hardship or misapplication of the act. So misapplication is the procedure was wrong. Um, that's basically it. That's, that's a misapplication of the act. You didn't follow the correct procedure. Um, and... Yeah. 
Can we ask questions along the way? Sure. So when it's with this particular one, similar or compatible uses, is there a time period that um, it relates to? So if something was used in a similar way 40 years ago, like, is there a statue of limitations There's, in terms so, of time? There is something called legally non-conforming uses. And, and I'll talk about that. And that's kind of what you're getting at. There's what the Community, Pla Community Planning Act says about similar to or compatible uses. It's what's allowed in the zone. So it's not really historical. It's, it's uh, and, and I think one of, just to be perfectly frank, one of the issues with the Shamcook Rural Plan is that it's out of sync with what is the reality on the ground. When it was written in 2011, that was more of an industrial area. So it was rural and mixed use and pretty much anything could happen, light industrial allowed. Um, and you had light industrial uses there. And then over time, those uses left, but the plan never changed and allowed those uses to continue. And so that's how that situation happened and um you know it's i think it was a very tough decision for prac to say we know what's on the ground but we also know what's allowed in the zone um and so then that's the other side of an appeal it's not just the uh neighbors or or anybody who doesn't like the decision who can appeal it's also the applicant so if you rule against an applicant as happened to the pac they can say we think you made the wrong decision based on uh, misapplication or unreasonable hardship. And that can be overturned by the appeal board. So it goes both ways um, with appeals. Um, but historical use, uh, legally, you kind of lose that grandfathering after 10 months of discontinued use. Um, there's some at PAC might get involved with those cases too. Uh, and I, I'll, I do have a slide on non-conforming uses, but, um, honestly, that was a very difficult decision for PRAC. Uh, they made the decision they did. It's been appealed and the appeal board seems to be super, super slow because I'm, they've also undergone restructuring and local governance reform stuff and, who knows if the applicant even wants to proceed at this point? I have no idea. There's really been no communication. So PAC, just so you're aware, when this PAC was actually appealed, it took almost six months for an appeal process to actually take place. So it can take time. And even within the, the as long as the appeal documents were submitted on time, proceed uh, an applicant or somebody that has received an, uh, a pass by PRAC or PAC can't actually start moving forward until the, the appeal process they can we advise them not to because they can be required to return the site to the existing condition but as it stands now prac did approve that um and the reason it hasn't moved forward is because we said if you do you might have to do this and you can make that decision and they clearly decided not to move ahead Oh, perfect. Non-conforming uses. Um, so you hear people say grandfather a lot, and that's basically a non-conforming use. Uh, so when a rural plan or zoning bylaw is made, um, you might have a parcel of land that's doing something that the new zone it goes into, it's it's no longer allowed to do. Uh and and generally they're not great to have. You don't want to create them unless it's uh, you know particularly noxious use in a place that um, it really doesn't make sense. Uh, I can't think of any the top of my head in St. Andrews. Um, for ex um, let's say. Uh, We'll use the, the Shamcook uh, lobster plant, for example. Let's say that that, was, that had been an industrial site. It was operating, and the rural plan was changed 
to say this is now residential only zone. That use would become legally non-conforming. So it was legal at one time, but now it's non-conforming. And that puts it in a very different category with development rights and what they can and can't do. Um, you basically cannot expand or intensify a non-conforming use. So it can continue. Um, there's been a few, nothing I've been involved in, but I've seen some cases, uh, some appeals cases where it's a, a farm thing. Um, and, you know, the, the residential area kind of grows around the farm and eventually the council says, all right, we're going to change the zoning of the farm to match residential area. Um, it probably isn't a great idea. Uh, we need agriculture. That's an aside. Um, and then, and then the farmer, uh, if they get another cow, they've expanded, they've intensified. So there's some, there's one case up in, uh, Edmondson, I think that, that went back and forth for, uh, years um and recently got worked out that had to do with that so these can become very controversial and you have people who said i've been you know doing this forever and why can't i keep going and um it's uh i every once in a while you get one uh because something burns down um i don't think that happened in st andrews i think we have one in grandma nan um Legally non-conforming really only applies to uses. It doesn't apply to dimensions. And typically in the zoning bylaw, and I know in St. Andrews, this is the case, uh, there are some undersized lots and there are some buildings which probably don't meet the standard. So basically, as long as they don't make it worse, they can keep going. So I think they were able to, they did, there was a, maybe it was a variance or something. Something had to come forward. Um, that was actually Alex's file, so. I don't remember. Um, but yeah, they uh, they can be very, very complicated. Um, but uh, basically, it's 10 months uh, is the kind of cutoff point. So if the, um, the use hasn't been there for 10 months, then it's those rights are gone. Um, and it basically anything new has to conform to the zone. There's there's uh, no way to restart the use after that point. But if it's within 10 months, then you can restart the use. And PAC has the uh, power to change that use to a similar or non-conforming use. Uh, if we deal with that, we'll we'll talk about it. But uh, is there anything I've dealt with before? Yeah, so this is about extending non-conforming uses that 10 month, uh, except PAC has the power to say, actually it was, you know, you you can say we'll give it longer. Um, and then there's the part about damage. If it's it's almost like this flow chart of decisions that happen. Um, and and as I said, it can be very complicated. Um, and if it has to be dealt with, we'll deal with it. Next. Subdivisions. Uh I'm not actually sure if PAC has the, the power to name streets. We just dealt with this with uh, Adelaine and no, it's just council's power. So don't have to name any streets. Don't worry about it. Um, next one. This is, uh, this is something that might come up. It probably will come up. Um, Judy will present it to you. Uh, <laughs> and I think Jill's seen a lot of these. Um, these are private access subdivisions. Uh, so it's not coming off a public street. It's a private lane. Um, it's so that sometimes it's owned by a homeowners association of people who uh, have properties that access it. Um, sometimes it's right of ways, uh, easements over somebody else's property. Those can get pretty complicated. Um, historically, uh, there's there's lots of issues with people who have handshake agreements and there's nothing on paper. Um, but this process makes sure it's done right. So at least going forward, uh, new subdivisions, you're making sure that um, there is proper access, there's proper responsibility for the road, the right things are on the deeds, um, and uh, the private access isn't going to 
affect the ability to subdivide adjacent land. That's kind of what I was talking about with how streets are laid out. So Next. just just a couple examples of private access roads that are here in town. So you've got like Quaddy Shores up past Cemetery Road, and you've got like down by O'Neill Farm Road. Those are two private access roads that are yeah. off of public roads yeah. in, in town. And there's they, lots out in 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 Bayside, Bayside Champion. Champion Cook. So just just so you're aware, those are they their roads aren't to municipal standards and but they have to upkeep them they have to plow them themselves they have to maintain them but if they ever wanted to turn them over to the town they would actually have to be brought up to municipal standards and a lot of these times the roads are built narrower and don't have the width capabilities to to build back to municipal standards so that's why we do encourage when building in town as much of public access roads as possible but yeah the options are there for private access so next slide um this doesn't usually come up because we try and work with applicants so that it doesn't get to this point but you may get an application for a subdivision that's on land that really isn't suitable for it. Uh, it's too steep. It's too marshy. Um, there's also wetlands, which are a little different. We don't deal with wetlands. That's Department of Environment. Uh, Wawa, I don't know if you've heard that. It's a, a wet water course and wetland alteration permit. So within 30 meters of bodies of water that are not the ocean, um there's an extra permit that people have to get if they're doing things within 30 meters that's nothing we deal with although it sometimes is you know we put it as a condition just as an extra kind of layer um but people have to do it anyways uh the unsuitable for development's a little bit different and isn't something that comes up very much because usually if somebody's applying for it we'll just say like hey this is you know you really need to reconfigure how you're doing this it's not it's not going to work um and uh, I did mention that, you know, subdivision shouldn't make it impossible to subdivide land adjacent to it. And that's one of the reasons why public streets are good, because everybody can use a public street, whereas private roads, um, we have a bit of a policy for how we recommend these things, where private roads really only make sense if it's a dead end for natural reasons. So um, O'Neill Farm Road is a good example where it just ends on a peninsula. Um, so there's there's no connection there. Um, or you've got like, a, you know, a lot of the ones uh, coming off the 127 are running into Greenlaw Mountain or Simpson Hill or something that's going to make it impossible to develop further up land. Um, so those are dead ends in private streets that make sense. Um, but, you know, we, we try and steer people in the right direction with those. Uh, this is something that has to be in the zoning bylaw. I don't believe it is. So we'll just move right on past that one. Um, and, and these are just, this is kind of how you make decisions about refusals. Uh, Judy will walk you through these if, if this is the case. Um, but this is a bit of a, when you make decisions, it's it's good to give reasons for why you're making decisions. And so tying it back to the Community Planning Act and, and using that language is is really good. So these a lot of language in here and things taken out of the Community Planning Act um, that will be useful when those specific situations come up. OK. Decision making. Um, we're getting out of the regulations and uh, that kind of stuff and, and uh, how you're actually making decisions as a body. Um, you are a technical body, so you really should be making your decisions based on findings of fact, uh, using the applicable regulations, bylaws, um, policies. As I said, giving reasons why, um, you know, if you watch council meeting sometimes you'll hear people say this is why i'm doing this and that's they're not just saying that to so people hear their voice more they're actually saying it so that there's kind of this paper trail of accountability and reasoning behind it um so 
doing that and going through that process in your thinking as much as possible uh, and doing it out loud is really good. Um, documentation, that's not something you're going to have to worry about because Paul's on it. Um, and you're not going to have to worry. I don't think too much about writing motions because again, um, Paul's on it. Sometimes there's a bit of, uh, you, you can amend motions and, um, there's a list of rules that you have here, Robert's rules. Um, that's kind of how these things work. Uh, this is an unusual meeting because we're not making any decisions. So there's, um, I don't think we're worrying too much about motions, uh, but um, the only way that you as an individual member have power is to make a motion or amend a motion and then hope that people agree with you. Um, sometimes you'll see situations where people say, I think, you know, this thing and everyone just says, okay, and people move on because it wasn't a motion. Um, so uh, just keep that in mind, you know, if you want, your voice to be in there and a you know change something um there's a proper way based on procedure to do that and uh if you're not familiar with robert's rules you might want to do a little bit of reading up on that um but again you've got a great chair you've got paul um myself uh and and the other service commission staff um you know if you're like i want to do this thing with the motion but i don't know how to word it correctly we we can get there um, and that can happen kind of on the fly, so to speak. Um, but uh, I think every mo every agenda item will come with a motion uh, sort of pre-prepared for you with a blank in uh, approve or do you put the approve or reject in there? Uh, generally speaking, it like we'll base the motion off of what the, the service commission staff reports are. Yeah. And we will wordsmith them to get them to a point where staff feel comfortable as a motion for consideration but again you have the ability as as the pac to amend change table reject any motion that's brought yeah. forward so really we try to establish so it gives you guys a baseline of starting then it's up to you to finalize and and decide on the motion that's in front of you so there's a motion ahead of us tonight that you may want to amend so we'll actually get a chance to practice that and um it's another good point that Paul made. Uh, we You're not like thrown in blind. Um, we do write reports and give you a recommendation. Um, sometimes the recommendation relates to procedure. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, here's the reasons that planning staff see the, you know, intent of the municipal plan pointing to a decision in this way. Um, so you will have that, but please do your own research. Uh, we do site visits, we take pictures, but um, nothing is quite the same as being there yourself. So uh, you will not have the power to go on a private property as PAC. Um, I have that power uh, if they made an application as development officer, building inspectors have that power. So don't trespass, but you can, you know, it's a public road. Um, you can obviously go there, take a look. Um, Prime example would be if somebody wants to put a six foot fence fence in their front yard, you can drive up, look at the property, see the the concept of the fence that's been provided in the in the package, and and see for yourself is this something you can visualize being there, or is it, you know, when it comes back to PAC, you can talk about you know maybe the fence needs to be instead of a full wood fence, maybe it needs to be chain link or something that's got more transparency uh could be wrought iron uh considerations so like for instance of how does it affect animals so you know if you're going to that height don't put you know sharp points at the top spikes right so those are things that pac can add as conditions or, or changes to motions as they come forward but we do encourage you to go and actually do a site visit if you have an opportunity to do so yeah and um do I, I'm just going to see if it comes up in a slide. I don't think it does. So the way that um, an item will work on your agenda usually is uh, somebody, some planning staff will make a presentation. It could be me. Uh, Alex Henderson gets, he's my boss. He does do these sometimes um, for some reason. Uh, and I'm ha very happy to be it. I'm the St. Andrews guy. Uh, 
got this now, so that's really nice. Um, and uh, Vivian uh, Peng, she's a junior planner. She will be presenting some things to you as well, I'm sure. Uh, and then Judy Hartford, um, she deals with the subdivisions and uh, she very experienced, as I said. Um, so I won't be the only person you hear from, but we'll give a report that you'll get uh, five days before. Yeah, so we try to produce it uh, the Wednesday prior to your meeting, if not the Thursday. But you will always receive a digital copy of it first, and then we will provide a printed copy if if you want, as a based on your decision on how you want to work with files and documents. And then you can pose any questions to us as you read through your documents right up to the right up to the meetings here. And then but then we highly encourage you to bring those questions and comments forward. And we would also too if we if you have a question or something prior to the meeting, we'll try to actually bring it forward for you. Now, when you see the structured reports you get from the the commission, it's a lot of here's your background, here's the analysis here's how it ties to the municipal plan, the zoning bylaws. So they'll pull all of that out for you. So you have it right in front of you and then they'll give you a, a recommendation as to what, you know, based on all the information provided, this is how staff would recommend a motion to come forward for you. So we try to give you as much background and like work done as possible. So really you guys can absorb the information and make a, an informed decision. And just, um, I know from my, from my experience at PRAC, when we would make a motion, I mean, sometimes the motions get fairly wordy and I know you like them read into the record, um, but I know when PRAC was making motions, sometimes it would be something like, um, you know, I move that we accept the staff's recommendations because they're they're listed and fairly clear on the planning report. Um, so what do you think? Just for continuity purposes, because we do record it and people are are watching on Zoom, it's better to read the motion out and read the entire motion, and okay, then good. and then for that, then it's there's no everybody knows that it's out there. It's not just okay, we accept the staff's recommendation, right? Like always. Yep. So when the files come forward, the chair will actually read the mo like the motion background report, and then read the motion itself, and then it opens the floor to PAC for discussion at that point. The mover does that. Yeah, the mover would okay. do that. Yeah. And it's really important. Um, we will give you the information that we see as relevant uh, and give you the recommendation that we see based on best practices, uh, experience, what how we interpret the bylaws based on our professional experience and expertise. But it's your decision. You need to own it. Ask us questions, point out things, you know, uh, I make mistakes. I'm certainly not perfect. Um, I do not mind being called out on them. It's your job to make sure that I'm giving you the information you need. Um, so uh, please don't feel like you need, I mean, you know, be, don't be rude about it, but um, <laughs> please disagree. Like that's a sign of a really healthy committee is, is when you don't just agree with every recommendation we give you right. and there's, uh, you know, questions and um, consideration. Um, that's really important. And it's my job. Uh, I'm paid to be here. So I don't take it personally at all. Um, and, and none of the other staff do. So uh, just, just like when I'm at council, um, it's, uh, we want to work as collaboratively as possible, um, and help you make the best decisions possible, but you need to be comfortable with them. And, uh, you know, there's, even if you notice the group is going one way, if you don't feel comfortable with that, don't feel like you need to agree with everybody just to agree with everybody. You might want to be on record as opposing it or abstaining it it's absolutely your right um and uh it's an important part of being on the committee is is independent uh analysis and judgment one other aspect i'll point out to you is when although we've gone through all these documents the municipal plans zoning bylaws when you're looking at a file you're looking at that specific file that specific property that specific ask even if there's three or four different like asks, uh, like even like comparable motions that are on different files, your focus is on that file, that property, that request. 
everything else is does not matter you're you're looking at just that so some people would say that yeah that that we should not necessarily be looking at precedent there's there's obviously some opposing views to that i think it could be looked at to to a point of reasonableness but um at the same token each individual property has unique situations um that may not apply to the other one that you're holding up as a precedent so it, it is important that we look at each application on its own face as opposed to holding it up against holding it up against other properties that have had similar approvals it may just not fit just it worked in one place doesn't mean it's going to work everywhere that's right yeah, yeah. and there's some weird properties with strange dimensions and yeah um I don't know if there are any standards, but there's one I'm dealing with in St. Stephen that has three, it faces onto three streets, three public streets. Mm. That is a weird property. Um, and, you know, there. hopefully it doesn't need variances, but it might because of that. And uh, do you want to treat that property the same way as one that only has one fronting street? Probably not. So um, I think it's, it's a really good discussion to have and to think about, but um, I look at the specific property, the specific ask, um, and there may be reasons why it's, you know, really like that other property that had similar things. So there's cross comparison, but yeah. it might not. So. Um, so just a question along that you gave the example of the, the six foot fence in the front yard. So if something like that were to come to this group, would you go back and look at, you know, in the last five years, historically, if there's been other requests similar to that or anything to sort of guide that process or would that color it? Then usually speaking, you, you don't look back at the history of it. What you do is you look at, are there terms and conditions that can be applied to it under the zoning bylaw? So Xander, you would be able to speak a little bit more. Yeah. And uh, fences over three feet in front yards is a conditional use. So that's something that does come up. Um, And there's different, you know, a, uh there was one uh right on water street um where the style of the fence was very important so they wanted to go over six feet and uh they it was their decision but i think we would have required it anyways they were going to do this it's called a tiger eye it's like wrought iron um it's very traditional looking mm-hmm. um and that was because it was a very prominent place so it wouldn't make sense to apply that same thing uh certainly not in uh like in sham cook probably probably not it might depending on the property but um it's a little bit different what we try and do as or or i try and do as a planner who's who's thinking not just about these particular files but longer term what does this mean if we see something coming up again and again and again and again um that might be an indication that we actually want to amend the bylaw and that uh, this, if you keep approving the same thing over and over again, um, what's the point of that? Um, I don't know. Does that answer the question? Okay. Yeah, so just give you an idea prior to this zoning bylaw that it was introduced, like the, the fences in the front yard were basically stuck at like three feet, but they were kept being, we wanted a variance. We wanted a change because of the deer eating our, our gardens, you know, they, people wanted to protect it. So I know the service commission received a lot of applications for, I want a six foot fence. I want a six foot fence in my front yard. I want to protect. So in the last zoning bylaw that was written in that, although your fence can be three, like is regulated at 3.3 feet, you can get terms and conditions to go up to 6.6 feet, I believe is the, yeah. in the front yard. So there, there are ways to, that the zoning bylaw can be amended and changed based on if you have repetitive intakes and repetitive requests of, of, a, of a similar nature. Yeah. Um, next, almost mm-hmm. done. Um, so meetings are open to the public and uh in person online we're doing it all um for approvals mail outs are sent to neighboring property owners and i think one of the things uh on for discussion after this is how wide that is how many people 
Um, Because again, that's something that's just in the operating rules and procedures, the Community Planning Act gives no advice on how to do it. Um, probably no surprise, uh, not everybody's gonna be happy with the decisions. Um, you're an independent body, you're not council, you're not here to do what council wants you to do. Um, you're not here to make people happy necessarily. Uh, it's always nice when you can approve something and someone gets to start a new business, that's great. Um, but sometimes, uh, you know, that's that's not the case and um, the proposal doesn't work and, uh, or, you know, people, neighbors are very upset by something being approved, it happens. Um, so you'll deal with it. Uh, and I think what's really important is that you make your decisions publicly, uh, with reasoning, um, rationally ignoring people. Um, and, and this is an interesting one and it's come up before we will uh, catch people after the fact sometimes, like someone builds a fence and they didn't get a permit for it and it's too tall or something like that, or they built it in the town's right of way. Um, and the goal of uh, these documents and, and planning and, and really kind of everything we're doing, we're not, we're not here to punish people. Um, obviously, it's really nice when people go through the proper steps and, and do things right, but we want to bring people into compliance. Uh, so you you might have to just be like, I shouldn't have done that. Why did he do that? I just have to look at what he's applying for and pretend like the fence isn't already there <laughs> or the garage. Um, and that, but that, again, that goes both ways. That doesn't mean, oh, it's going to be so hard for him to tear it down and, you know, move it. Ignore that thought too. Pretend like it's not there and it's an application coming for to you uh, without that knowledge. <laughs> but so, but just so you know, garages and stuff, they're all part of the building code act and, and aspects like that. So there are other mechanisms and other steps that would be addressed by the service commission. If something like that were to happen and they didn't follow the building code and they yeah. didn't follow the zoning. No, law, building code other... is not something yeah. you're going to have to really worry about. Sometimes it'll be slightly relevant to an application. So we'll mention something about it, but if you think a zoning bylaw is complicated, that building code is something else. Uh, Mr. Cross probably knows a little bit about that. <laughs> um, but yeah, you're, you will make decisions that don't make people happy and you know, you'll, you'll get grumpy people and, and, uh, all sorts of people, right. You're working with the public now. So, um, you have to do your best. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, just one more point on the slide, it kind of goes with that, is sometimes you're dealing with pretty strong emotions in these things, and just you just have to do your best. Um, try not to react, uh, you know, try to be um, rational, calm as possible. Uh, again, staff are here um, to deal with, you know, situations that get really out of hand. They won't, but... Um, the biggest thing I can say is PAC rely on us. That's why we're here. We're, we're, we're trying to be the subject experts for you. If there's some concern or some situation doesn't matter, ask staff to, to look into it, deal with it. Um, again, when you go through the process here, if you're not comfortable to make a decision or a motion, table it. There's no reason why it can't come back to another meeting and have more information come back. And sometimes in a situation, if it, if emotions and situations are getting out of hand, easier to table it, let everyone's heads cool, come back at another meeting and, and continue the discussion. So don't be pressured into having to make the decision. If you can table and come back with and ask for further information, further clarifications, and to take the time to have everybody just settle down for a little bit so that's we also recommend that to council is you know if there's situations that you're not prepared to make a decision on table it ask for further information we'll bring it back for you um 
kind of on that though, it is it is important to you know this is a basically a volunteer committee, and um, most probably everybody here has a day job. Um, if you can read the reports beforehand, if you can look at the property, it does really help. Um, but but we are doing some of that legwork so that you don't always have to. Uh, and last slide, um, and this this touches on these same kind of things. Uh, you do need to be careful with, because you are in this official role now, um, and you have authority to make decisions. Um, again, you need, you need to be careful. Uh, don't the, the safest thing is deal with it in public in the committee with your committee members. Um, somebody's asking you something in public, uh, you know, direct them to staff. That's always a good option. Um, I would I would not recommend trying to find the thing in the zoning bylaw and say, here's what you can do. Direct them to us. We have a whole process for it. They need it in writing. There's an application um, because that's, you know, there's a liability involved there. Uh, so, you know, people are really pushing you, be non-committal, um, don't agree to things, say, you know, just bring it to the committee, be dealt with, it'll be fair, it'll be impartial. And if you, you know, really want to know something, talk to staff. Uh, conflicts of interest. Um, there are obvious ones and there are less obvious ones. And in general, you don't want to even appear being in a conflict of interest. Uh, I would say um, the the mayor, uh, he's very good at making sure he does not appear to be in a conflict of interest. So if there's a decision about property next to him, he's he's out. Uh, if it's something that's, um, so lo under the local governance act, pecuniary interest or, or conflict of interest comes into place usually when pecuniary funds are collected. So if you are making a profit off something that is a decision by council or, or your decision, then that is a conflict of interest. But the, the best advice we've given council is if you feel uncomfortable discussing like if it's a property beside you or you know it's a close friend or something when in doubt step out just step away from it and let the rest of the committee make the decision on your behalf if you think you might be in a conflict of interest then draw you probably are <laughs> correct and all and all you have and all you have to do at the beginning of the meeting is declare it to, uh, at that time and when that section of the the agenda actually comes up what you do is you actually step up and you leave the section of the meeting here so generally speaking you either can go into the lobby or what most counselors do is just head to the bathroom <laughs> yeah and uh and there's i mean there is like kind of a you know we live in a small town small area everybody knows everybody um kevin can't be in a conflict of interest with everybody who goes to the hearing that would be pretty much everybody. So, um, you know, there's, you do have to use your judgment. Um, just because you know somebody doesn't mean you're in a conflict of interest. But uh, if they're a family member, if people know you hang out with them a lot, that's and you have that feeling, trust your feeling. Um, and I think I said this already. You know, don't make decisions to make people happy. Make decisions that are rational, that are based on reason, based on the documents that are there. Um, you shouldn't be saying, uh, I feel this. That's probably a bad indication. Um, you know, maybe that's a good time to table something. If you have strong feelings about something, take some time. Um, consult more. Uh, but um, your job is not to make people happy. And I can tell you that because that's not my job either. And sometimes that's not great, uh, but generally people understand that you're fulfilling uh, an important role, important function, and it's not personal, it's business. It's, uh, it's you're doing your job. Um, and the municipality is very grateful for you to be doing your job. I'm grateful. I like working with PACs and councils. Um, it's it's really nice to work with people who want to give back and everybody here does. So I've taken an hour, half your time. I'm very sorry. That was a ton of information. Uh, try and review it as you can when files come up. Um, 
you know, reach out. Uh, we're all available. As Paul said, always rely on staff. We're here to help you. Um, and I'm going to stop talking. Well, Mr. Gopin, that was, oh, sorry. Please, absolutely. So how many in the province, how many PACs are there versus PRACs? That's a great question. Um, I think uh, all all of the cities would have their own PACs. Um, in the region, uh, it's you and Graham and Ann, um, and that's kind of a legacy thing for them. Uh, so it's... I I don't really know outside. There's some strange situations. Like there's one local PRAC, which only deals with one municipality, but it's a uh, committee of the Regional Service Commission. I don't know how that happened. It's not here. It's Shediac or something like that. Um, Up north, it's probably more prevalent because there's more municipalities and rural areas. I'm right. Sure. Yeah. So um, but I know like St. John, Fredericton, Moncton, they definitely have their own PACs um but then like st george or eastern charlotte now they're they're going to be using the prac um you know some people like and and st andrews has actually had a bit of a back and forth there was a pac and then it went to prac and then back to pac and um you know sometimes there's a feeling of uh it's good to have people outside the community involved in decisions that affect the community because that can get rid of some of those conflict of interest things, but then there's also the feeling of, well, their decisions for our community, it should be the community making them. So mm -hmm. there's there's debate, There's uh, they're both allowed under legislation. So that's what we do. <laughs> well, Mr. Gopin, thanks so much for your presentation. I know, uh, I know how much goes into these, so. Uh, we appreciate that a lot. And I know for the new members, um, once you start to see some of these reports that that come out to prepare us for these meetings, I think you're going to appreciate uh, them as much as I do at the planning office because they uh, they really do so much legwork for us and uh, they really give us a lot to think about. And um, I'm grateful. So thank you. Okay. Anybody else have any other questions for Mr. Gopin before we move on? No? Okay. I'm sure there will be yeah, as, as time goes on. Time. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks so much. Okay. So our next uh, item on the agenda was we were going to discuss and make some, hopefully make some amendments to our, our rules. We talked about them last month. Uh, we talked about um, adding to section 33 to just tighten up the fact that we include terms and conditions applications in that section, as well as uh, a land recognition um, statement at the beginning of our meetings. We wanted to put that into the rules as well. Um, we also kind of organically started discussing uh, last month uh, what the polling, the neighborhood polling on applications should look like. And so that's going to become um, certainly part of the discussion tonight. But before we go to any motions or anything like that, uh, Mr. Knopper has prepared a planning report for us. So please, over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, as discussed at the last PAC meeting, so several of these items were brought forward. So PAC has the ability to review, amend, and change your own rules and, and regulations for operating procedures. What was brought forward was what was listed in terms and conditions uh, to be added because it is a section that is under the, the zoning that PAC can handle and it should be listed as such, as well as uh, it was recommended to have the land recognition brought forward. But I think one of the most critical parts that we really need Need to discuss here is sham cook and bayside mail outs so in the town of st andrews when we do mail outs here again it's 15 days prior to the pac application uh, coming forward and the, it's written out to within 100 meters of said property generally speaking on average we can send out anywhere between 30 and 60 letters to adjacent property owners so it, it is a bit tasking and time consuming however necessary to get a, a proper feedback and understanding from the the local area within the the request 
most of the time you get one, two, maybe three letters that come from it with suggestions or a lot of the time it's like, I, I approve or, you know, I support this. Sometimes you get considerations from, from others uh, for other concepts or flat out, you know, I don't like it. So it's, it really varies now in situations where it comes to based on Shamcook, because it's a more rural area, there's more distance in between the properties. A lot of the properties don't actually have residents on them. So trying to do a mail it within a hundred meters, you could be hitting one residence, right? So is that really a, a justification and a, and a good process to be using with, with with mail outs. So looking at a couple of other uh, service commissions and a couple of other PACs and just general rural areas, since we are already hitting in town an average of 30, it's at least, you know, something to consider is, you know, do you want to look at this as a distance space, uh, distance and number of household spaces or number of households? So and that's for your consideration tonight. Uh, I've got some options for you there. So um, perhaps it's it's a good idea to look at a minimum of at least 15 households that are within a, a close geographical range of that. And that's excluding any properties that have no residences on them. So if they're vacant properties, we wouldn't send a letter to them. We would find the next closest house within that. Other options you have are increasing instead of doing a 100 meter mail out, you could look at a 500 meter mail out or even up to a kilometer mail out. When I started just looking at some of the areas in, in both Shamcook and Bayside, I mean, you're going to hit 30, potentially 40 homes just by doing it within a 500 meter or a one kilometer radius, which would get a good geographical intake of information and people to really look at, at the files that are being presented. So it comes back to PAC for what you are comfortable with uh, and and what options you would like to look at for your specific rules of, of operation. But I would, as staff, I would recommend at least a minimum of 15 households are, are, are a part of the mail outs and, or you can do the hybrid of 15 homes or within a one kilometer radius or a 500 meter radius. Uh, I think that's for you to debate, but at least it gives you a starting point for discussion. Yes, I guess we should get a motion on the table before we go too far. I, I also think um, it might be a good idea maybe to modify the motion that's here on the um, on this document to include the amendment to the mail out. Uh, I'm sure I would rec actually recommend that. Then it's one motion for the whole change. Exactly, exactly. So we should get a motion on the table and then sort of solidify that number um, if uh, someone would like to make a motion we can get a discussion going new members can raise their hands too absolutely the the motion is here on the report <laughs> madam chair would you like to read the motion sure i will read the motion uh, so the recommended motion would be that the Planning Advisory Committee of the Town of St. Andrews amends the Rules of Operation and Procedures Planning Advisory Committee to add the following changes. Number one would be adding to Section 3, uh, Terms and Conditions. Number two would be adding to Section 33 as well for the land recognition. And number three is adding to Section 34 regarding the land recognition. That's the motion before us. It does not include uh, anything about the mail outs. I will so move. Thank you very much. Does that include the amendment? Yes. Second that motion. Thanks, Mr. Cross. All right, so we can get into some discussion certainly about uh, our modification to the mail outs if someone wanted to get us started. Got some, as as Mr. Knopper said, he's got a couple of recommendations. Yeah, the 15, 15 properties is, is the big one, I think. you got to at least hit that many. The, the distance thing I kind of struggled with back and forth in my, when I was reading it is that I think it's fine, but we have to make sure that it's, it's 15 properties uh, within that thousand meter radius or mm -hmm. whatever number we choose here tonight. I think a thousand meters a kilometer is pretty I think we're pretty safe if we say that. So uh, I would go with the as long as we're hitting the 15 properties or property owners. So let's go ahead. So you're saying a minimum of at least 15 properties. Um 
but what if there's not 15 properties within that kilometer? Are we are we stop are we stopping at that six that are within that kilometer? Uh, you can uh, you can amend the motion if you are, or or in a discussion aspect that you can say, you know, a minimum of 15 households has to be met as a threshold whether it's within a thousand meters or beyond a thousand meters. So at least if you're setting the threshold as at minimum 15 households, then regardless of, or the radius, if it's within a thousand meters or beyond a thousand meters, you're at least structured that way. I, I also wanted to give some thought to the the notion that we only want to hit a household. Um, you mentioned something earlier saying that some of the properties within a specific radius wouldn't even have a house on them. But would it not also be fair to those property owners to be able to contribute to um, any development just because they don't have a house doesn't mean it wouldn't matter to them? You know what I mean? Because they may have a house on it later. Or they may, they, they still may care. Yeah. Yeah. So within that context, you could still say, you know, a minimum of 15 households plus any, well, any properties within that radius could be selected as with a minimum of 15 households have to be hit. So I, I can see where you're trying to go. You want 50, a minimum of 15 households. You want at least all the property owners within, regardless of the situation household or not to to within a thousand meters to to be provided. Yeah, if we pick that up. would that would be a fair number of letters going out per request, so that you would be hitting vacant properties, you'd be hitting households, yeah. and and covering a, a fairly large section of area. And I mean, I think we're as staff, we would still be looking at probably forty to sixty letters going out anyways within that type of radius. Xander, would do you have any comments when it comes to? Uh... I would just consider one of the reasons why we send mail outs is um, the impact that it would have on those properties. And there might be a certain point where, and I don't know if it's a kilometer, mm -hmm. um, probably isn't, but depending on the thing, it, you know, is somebody going into a yard, like a dimensional variance, is that going to affect somebody a kilometer away? Probably not, but uh, use use variances are probably going to be more um, impactful. But I think from a well, it is a little bit more work for staff. Um, you know, one of the criticisms that came during the appeal or the to be appeal is that it wasn't a wide enough mail out. It met prax rules and operating procedures, um, but that was something, and so. Uh, if you really want to cover your bases, I would I would say go wider. And you might get people saying, "Why are you mailing me about something that's happening like way over there?" Yeah, I. Yeah. Yep. Yes. So just to clarify, so in the town of St. Andrews, you would do on average thirty mailouts. Approximately. So it depends on the location of where it is. So if let's say it's in the middle of the town flat, yeah, I'm going to be doing 40 to 60 mail outs because it's going to hit a, within a hundred meter radius. You're hitting a lot of properties. Right. Right. But if I were to go into the subdivision, for instance, I'm not going to hit the same volume of homes, but on average across for all the mail outs we've done. And I went back and I did a, a calculation on the number we've mailed out. The average is between 30 and 32 mail outs between all of the mail outs we've done in, in, in this PAC's time. Right. So when looking at it from a rural standpoint, because it's such a greater distance between properties, it's, it makes sense to go with a wider geographical area for mail outs because you will get more, you potentially are hitting more responders within it, or in the same similar aspect, you're hitting the same number of properties as you would hit in town. So vacant or residential in, or commercial or, or industrial in Champlain Bayside, majority of them here in, in town would be residential that we'd actually send me. But to give you an idea, um, one of the mail ads we did uh, for Argyle Court actually had to go to NB Power. And mm. MB Power responded back right. and said, you know, because this property, this converted dwelling is right beside our terminal station, they actually had to sub 
submit their plans for what they were doing to MB Power to ensure nothing was going to interfere with right. that. So there, there are other groups of and businesses out there with vacant property or something on it that may have a comment to right. come back. So right. it's really impressive to see the number of properties and who owns the properties and who we have to send the letters to. Mm -hmm. it, it, oftentimes I'm sending letters to the US, uh, Ontario, Quebec, mm -hmm. um, pretty much anywhere be because we have such a wide variety of ownership in, in the community that I've gotten feedback all the way from BC from after sending a letter out within the 50 right. day period. So it's, it's really just to, to put it out there blanket and say, you know, within your, within the hundred meters, you know, a property is trying, is looking at consideration and PAC is going to consider this file right. to the same extent as, as Sander noted that lobster pound in sham cook was within a hundred meter mail out. So, right. Or sorry, two, yeah. 200. So I'll just say frack. Uh, the policy is with, and I don't know if we're changing this because the municipal areas have gotten bigger, like Eastern Charlotte. Um, in the former municipal areas where there was a higher level of density, it was 100 meters. And in the rural areas, it was 200 meters. I I think I would encourage going higher than 200 meters because um, mm. we had know from experience that there was feedback that that wasn't big enough. So, yeah. yeah avoid that. So well, I certainly don't want overkill, but I certainly w would also like to get a good cross section of feedback from the residents because I know people care about this stuff. So, I would agree, and I I think it's critical that we go larger. I would like to see a thousand meters, yeah, which includes um, a minimum of fifteen households. But I I also uh, believe that we should be um, including property owners so that a house isn't currently there but it, it there there is a plan there potentially is a plan sure. and somebody is going to have an opinion potentially so so am i hearing that we want to modify our rules to include uh, minimum surrounding properties uh, to include uh, 1000 meters in radius and at least 15 yeah. Property owners or 15 so, households? I, I would Sorry. Say all properties within a thousand meters, but must include 15 residential properties. Okay. So, um, motion you could add to is a mail outs with yeah mail outs within a thousand meters to all property uh owners within the mail out radius and must hit a minimum of 15 households. Residential property. Yeah. yeah. So that's an amendment to uh, the motion just to clean it up. Do we agree with that amendment? Yes. Mover? Yes. Thank I you agree. very much. Seconder? Do we? we oh, you no, no. seconded it, sir? Yes. yes. I will. You will stay with that. <laughs> so just to. Uh, just to so clarify. Funny. Sorry, Madam Chair, we might also want to put Bayside and Sham Cook. Yeah, we should. Bayside and Sham Cook oh, mail it. Of course. <laughs> That's very good. Oh, oh my, my goodness. That's the whole, that the whole was tale. Good catch. <laughs> Thank you. I have no concept. What's 100 meters? Like, anyway, I, I just thought it wasn't long enough. But anyway, okay. So we have um, just a modified motion in uh, section number four would be modify mail out radius in Sham Cook and Bayside to the 1,000 meters or a minimum of 15 households. Is that what I heard? Yeah. You might just want to word that as in uh, for properties that fall under the Bayside and Shamcook planning areas, because that's how they're referred to in the uh, legislation. And they don't exist as local service districts anymore. So just to be safe. Okay. All right. So, yes. Yes. Okay, so everyone is uh, good. Modify the mail-out radius in the Bayside and Shamcook planning areas to be 1,000 meters or at yep. a minimum of 15. Can uh, 1,000 meters to all property owners with a minimum of 15 residential, residential properties. Okay. Yeah. That way you're covering all property owners and okay. at least 15 residential okay. properties. I like it. All right. Yeah. So... If everyone, if everyone's happy with that, I guess we've got a motion and we've got a seconder. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 
Any opposed? There being none, that motion is carried. I just felt like something. Okay. All right. Well, that was good. It's always nice to button up those rules. And I like the addition of um, the Sham Cook and Bayside planning areas uh, really having their voices heard in these processes. It's a good thing. So, Madam Chair, I'll make sure it's all updated. Thank uh, you. As well as we're going to do a full grammatical review on this. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> PAC Simmons provided me a couple of uh, sections there, but we will make sure because it's been modified so many times. It's, okay. okay. We'll make sure a, a clean copy is provided to all members of the PAC. All right. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So that having been uh, dealt with, we've got no zoning applications, applications, excuse me, no variance applications, terms and conditions or sign applications. Any new business at this point? No new business. Any comments from members? I'd just like to welcome the new members to PAC. Sorry, Jeff. I know you were going to say that, <laughs> but you got to jump first here, right? <laughs> yeah, I think it's going to be a great learning curve for you guys, and it, it it's a bit of reading once Paul gets everything to you and your your booklets and your binders, so you can read. But it's fun, and and one thing that Xander didn't mention, and I I know it was in there, but just remember NIMBY, right? Oh, yeah. It not my backyard syndrome, and happens all the time. That's it lives in all of us we all experience it i'm sure yeah and the ex parte communications as well is super important with just a small town atmosphere I, anyway just have to be super careful about that uh so we have no closed items here we are at uh, 8 46 i will declare the meeting closed thank you very much see you next month everybody